Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Torrance Boone. I lead Google's agency business across the Americas. And please join me in welcoming Tony Morrison. Thank you. Ms. Morrison, I think we'll, we'll dive right in to your new work, Home. And how about you set the stage for us in terms of the inspiration behind the book, how you came to, to bring it to all of us? Sure. I was interested in um, sort of taking the skin or the scab off of our view of the 50s in this country. Uh, from take, I want, take my, I want my country back, remember that in the campaign? Back to where? Back to the 50s. Um, the 50s were understood to be Doris Day and Leave it to Beaver, and everybody was buying houses, and post-war money, nice, comfortable, American dream stuff. And I didn't think so. And I thought what was underneath there was something that was being silenced or ignored. One was the Korean War, which nobody ever talked about. It wasn't even called a war. It was called a police action. And we're still fighting it, if you recall. There's somebody up there with guns on one side and guns on the other. And also there was uh, overwhelming um, anti-communism, you know, the McCarthy thing. That was there. It was very strong. And people lost their jobs. And, you know, some committed suicide because of the pressure against communism, which I guess was what the war was about anyway, you know. North Korea was communist and something was going to make South Korea communist. Same thing with Vietnam. So it was a big anti-communism thing. The other thing was um, there was a lot of medical experimentation on helpless people, um, prisoners, uh, army people. I think we learned about it a great deal when we learned how LSD had been used on soldiers during the Vietnam War to see what effects it had. Uh, and then, of course, we learned what effects it had. <laughs> uh, so, but there was a lot of that even before. Prisoners and poor people and children and so on. And experimentation, you may not remember, but there was this scandal in quotes about uh, black school, Tennessee, I think. Anyway, where the men who had syphilis were being treated, treated in quotes. Some of them were treated and some of them were not. And they didn't treat them all because they wanted to see what it, the disease looked like as it progressed. Mm -hmm. And so that was one. But there were lots of others. And there's still, you know, particularly in other countries. So I had some example of that in home with the girl who's working for a doctor who is an inventor, as he puts it. So those were the main themes that seemed to me to be going on in the 50s. And I wanted to, you know, identify them by the narrative, having him go through these things so the reader could get a feel, a fresh feel of what it was really like in the 50s, despite what your grandmother says. <laughs> so Frank Money, who's the protagonist in Home, is this incredibly complex, vividly rendered character. What do you like most about him? What do you like least about him? You know, I didn't like him. <laughs> <laughs> really. I liked talking to him. You know, when he was talking to me and telling me to shut up, or I didn't know what I was talking about, and so on. That relationship, 
And he was all right, but he wasn't one of those. I tend not to really like the major characters. I tend to like the little ones, you know, you know, the little minor characters, mm -hmm. like the woman in the house where C was, mm -hmm. who fed her the maid. I like her. Mm -hmm. And she seems complex, real, and lovely. The others are representative, representative of problems. Their problems, the problems, they're very complex. And they move from one area to another, from weakness to strength, from ignorance to knowledge, from you know A to Z. So in the process, I just want to do them justice, whatever it is. They're not like good or bad or fun or not. So I don't really like them. But I don't mind being in their company because they're really, really, really very interesting. <laughs> so I pulled out a few images, phrases, word constructions throughout the novel that grabbed me. Uh -huh. And I thought maybe we could do a little free association where I would read these to you and you could give me your sense of how you came to bring these words to us, why you chose them, just sort of a window into the creative process. So are you ready? I am. OK. All right. <laughs> Maniac moonlight, militant sunlight, the malevolent sun, sun's violent rays. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you know, we think about the sunlight as, ooh, it's daylight, and ooh, the sun. You know, it's a big ball of fire up there. <laughs> and it's not going anywhere. And it can be very mean, or look so. So mm -hmm. I have to say, in addition to that, I was trying to make um, his going home, his arrival at this little village wonderful, because he hated it. He was bored with it, and it was, he couldn't wait to get out of there. So now he's going back for a good reason to save his sister. But I withheld all the color from the book until he gets close to home. Mm -hmm. and the first time he sees this girl's yellow blouse, then when he gets to home, he says, I didn't know these trees were this green. I didn't know, and what about the fly? Everything is a a flame. And that, I mean, you could tell it's a raggedy little town, right? But that makes the reader feel the welcome, feel the loveliness, the home quality uh, there. So, but some of the harsher aspects of that trip was militant metal. <laughs> and vicious things that we take for granted as, as love. You just make it, you know, the point of writing is to take what's common and estrange it, make it new again. Mm -hmm. And to take what's uh, strange and familiarize it. I just, it's a better experience and language can do that. Yes. <laughs> the quiet seemed to slither then boom, its weight more theatrical than noise. Yeah, silence is more theatrical sometimes than noise. If you're in a certain mood, and the slither suggests the threat of being alone, and no one's there, and you're in trouble, and then all of a sudden it's like a thunder, although you don't hear it. It's just an emotional response to alone, being alone and being afraid. The Morrison case. Uh, <laughs> I think I put the guy's name in there. There was a case. This woman, Lily, worked in a theater in Seattle in the 50s during the you know, heavy uh, anti-communist thing. So there were all sorts of plays and things that were banned. And this one almost got on stage. It was called the Morrison case, and I checked it with Google <laughs> <laughs> to find out exactly. 
And I found the guy and, the, you know, the mood, the play and everything. Because my editor was saying, Tony, please, the Morrison case. And I said, well, no, that's the name of it. But I had to go and really make sure by giving him the first name of the man who wrote the play and the history of how, you know, it was banned. Because they shut that whole theater down in the book because it was pro communist or socialist or whatever they were mad at at the time. <laughs> okay, finally, in reference to Lily, and this is one of my favorite references, um, <laughs> Frank is obsessed <laughs> with the backs of her <laughs> knees. Yeah. Well, you know, when you write about physical attraction, you know, want a detraction and somebody falling in love or making love. It's just so unrelentingly, relentlessly boring. <laughs> <laughs> because, first of all, if it's too graphic, you just go to sleep. And besides, it's not my sex is sexier than yours, because it's mine. So I assume yours is sexier <laughs> than mine. So why don't you do something different? Like associate it with some feeling or, uh, you know, when I wrote um, The Beloved, I had these guys watching Setha in a cornfield, making love to this guy. They can't see her. They can see the tops of the corn waving. And then the language goes on about how slippery the hair, and how the sound of the husk when it's pulled down off the corn cob. So it's all about corn. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a guy say, you know, I'll never, ever see corn the same way again. <laughs> and in this one, um, the same thing. Uh, you know, I know it's B and B, you know, boobs and butts. But, you know, <laughs> how, I mean, so. But I thought if, for him particularly, there are other parts of the male body and other parts of the female body that can pull out a separate, distinctive, peculiar affection. So when she, you know, reaches up to put this stuff up and he's looking at her, he sees the back of her knees, it overwhelms him. Well, you know, yeah, well, something. But I thought that was charming because it was part of the physique or the body that nobody pays attention to ever. I mean, you know, you're gonna write about that. <laughs> i tell you the great thing, and this will be the end, because you didn't ask me about this. This is a triumph <laughs> for me. Nobody cares, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> nobody remembers, nobody cares. But I have a moment when he says, I don't know what he says. So it's like it wasn't just uh, the sexual relationship that I was interested in. Something, something. Anyway, he says, how do I say this? How do I or you say this without either using profanity or something? So I say, it wasn't just the kingdom between her legs. Isn't that good? <laughs> if you think about it, if you say <laughs> the kingdom between her legs, you know, what is kingdom? Something you uh, attack, mount, riches, wealth, destroy. <laughs> and it's just a world of stuff. So I was telling somebody about that in a restaurant. This guy who writes, I said, isn't that wonderful? And he said, eh. <laughs> <laughs> so your your work takes on these these big themes of humanity, um, things like love and class uh. and race and politics, identity among many others. Share with us any conscious commentary or insight you were trying to shed on these themes with home. Well, home. I think we mentioned it a little bit earlier. At lunch, I was trying to write a book that 
as I said, identified these sort of special aspects of um, the 50s. So I have this vet who was, you know, they called it shell shock. But the thing is, he, I never say he's black. Now, that may sound very simple, but I have to tell you, the language is so loaded, the, the American English, that you almost have to, you know, pry and discover other ways to say things. So it's an achievement. I didn't do it in the beginning. I did it somewhat in paradise because I have a bunch of women out there and I say they shot the white girl first and saved the bullets for the rest. So you go, oh, who is a white girl, <laughs> if you're interested. But I was able to carve language so that it is not, imp not important, not distinguished, and I don't describe any of my characters. I mean, a little bit, you know, this tall, short man, woman. But nobody knows what they look like. And the reason is deliberate, because I want you to do that. You to see them, imagine them, you know, underscore them the same way. So, um, and now I've gone off and forgotten your question. What was <laughs> <laughs> These big themes of humanity. Oh, yeah, these big themes. Love. Yeah, yeah. Class. <laughs> Love, yeah. Race. Yeah, politics. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's take love. Okay, he finds a safe haven with this girl in Seattle. Um, but uh, I didn't want the love, you know, there are all kinds of love. You understand that, don't you? This national love of your country, love of your God, love of your, I mean, you know, it's not all sexual love, there's some other stuff. So I wanted a relationship between a brother and a sister. I could not, I wanted a relationship uh, between a man and a woman that had no baggage. Mother, daughter, wife, you know, it's always about something else. But with the sister, I thought, even though that might be difficult, it could be equal, you know, so on. The opening lines of home are about his looking at these horses. And he says they were so beautiful, so brutal, and they stood like men. So it's about masculinity. It's about whatever that definition is. He found one definition here, another definition there. But the security, the pride, the strength, the beauty, really, of manhood is that love that he encouraged and found when he went home and took care of someone. They didn't have to, I mean, it was his sister, but he had to go there, take care of her, mm -hmm. hold her in his arms, take her someplace, and then stay away, because the women wouldn't let him in the house. And that kind of love, as opposed, in addition to the backs of people's knees, you know, there's this other stuff, you know. And politics, you know, is, always there. You could see it in the confrontation with the doctor who was manipulating her. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that in that little town they didn't have any uh, school or water, you know, in, where are they, Georgia? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> down these little, you ever see these little places? I went down to see one where my father was born. It's, uh, nothing. But anyway, I mean, you have to wait to get fresh water or a water pipe or something in some of these places. Nevertheless, I wanted it to be welcoming. And for him, it's a safe place. And that's what home is. Nobody is out to get you at home. It's a yearning always. I think that's why I was telling a number of people that the French, when they translated the book, they didn't have any word for home. The French don't. <laughs> no, they have house. They have a state. They have all sorts of things, but not home. Mm -hmm. And home is something very peculiar for Americans. And there's a yearning in it, you know, some special, mystical, hopeful, restful. 
So it's not even the place. But when one says home, you hear it in songs all the time. It's something very special. It has nothing to do with the way it looks. And that's what I was hoping would be the feeling when he arrived there, knowing that no, everybody doesn't like you in your home. Some people really dislike you in your home. But no one is going to hurt you. Everybody is going to help you, whether they like you or not. <laughs> and that's the safety, the spiritual and physical safety of home. It's fantastic. So um, shifting gears a little bit around the intersection of creativity and technology, because we're here at Google. Oh, yes. Um, so I think everyone would, would love to get a sense of your character sketch. If Google were to be a character, <laughs> <laughs> what would it look like? What would it do? Well, I'm, you know, not a Luddite, but I'm getting, I'm getting better. <laughs> My son is not saying anymore, Ma. <laughs> Please. Anyway. I think I know exactly what Google looks like, character-wise. And it's like those big metal clawy <laughs> machines in Transformers. Transformers. <laughs> and they do this, and they go this, and then when they're threatened, <laughs> they turn into a little radio. Well, in one case, it turned into a little car. <laughs> and then after you pass them by, they come up again. <laughs> I can't tell you how I love that movie, because I think it was on an airplane where one of them was going clonk, clonk, clonk. And the stewardess went by, and he came, turned into a little radio that they don't even have anymore, with little knobs. <laughs> That's Google for me. It could be anything. Anything and everything. <laughs> and how, is, how has technology informed your creative process? You talked about using Google. It shortens research enormously. I mean, months of time that you would normally spend in, I know, libraries or just trying to read books. And, but this way, it's really shortened um, inquiry. I was telling them earlier, I was looking for Oh, it's me, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, documentation about who could not rent or buy property in Seattle in the 50s. And I knew, you know, black people could, but I, I didn't have any real examples. But via Google, I went through stuff and found these lease arrangements where they said no Hebraic or Negro, no, he, Afric, I mean, all these. No, Hebraic, Afric, sort of Chinese type person could rent or buy any property that, ex and couldn't live there unless they were working there. And that was on the lease. So when I have this character at home looking for a place to stay, she gets upset because she can't buy this house. I didn't want that to just be some memory or speculation on my part. So I would use, obviously, Google and anything for uh, research. It's very important that way. And I think we were talking also about writing, mm -hmm. blogs, Blogging, yeah. mm -hmm. and things. And I was saying, eh, I haven't seen any good f fiction writing on blogs. But I have seen very, very good prose in people who do them really good, sharp, uh, smart. Uh, it surprised me a little bit, because when I teach creative writing, as I did for a long time uh, at Princeton, and uh, I always was annoyed. And when, I, when they would turn in their stories, I could tell that they had type them on a computer. I can feel it because they say too much. 
and it looks so nice. <laughs> it's sort of neat, you know, because eh. so, they don't write anymore. But I could always feel that quality, and I thought that that would pass over into fiction writing in general. I don't know whether it has or has not. I suspect it has not, as I see poetry sometimes on it, which is a suggestion that uh, technology can aid. You know, it's the editing problem. That's the writing is really just editing. I mean, not just, but almost all of it is correcting, redirecting, finding the right word taking it out, you know, recasting over and over again until it's right. And it seems a little hard on the, com on the computer because you're so happy <laughs> with what you're doing. <laughs> i tell you one thing. You haven't asked me this, but I'm a really, really, really good expert typist. <laughs> and now that I'm sort of like vaguely emailing, I'm doing this these two fingers. <laughs> and I thought, wait a minute. <laughs> I know how to use all my fingers all the time. So now I have to retrain my muscle memory on the keyboard to sort of know what. <laughs> I lost it. You know, I know what do you use? Thumbs, <laughs> two fingers. <laughs> I mean, I lost the whole thing, and I'm so, so good at it. Anyway, technology will help me <laughs> in that way, too. <laughs> And, and what about the implications for the, the book publishing industry? No, that's going to be great. Oh, yeah, that whole thing is going to be great. I mean, I know people say, oh, the libraries, what about the books? What about the hardbacks? And what about, you know, it's like when the television was supposed to ruin radio. It didn't. Well, I don't think it did. But anyway, <laughs> uh, this form was supposed to get, the vinyl was going to be ruined because of the eight track, because of the thing. So I think my personal feeling is that the more access to books, the better. You know, really, I know that I was involved with some people who were doing that instant printing thing, mm -hmm. espresso, I think they called it. Because mm -hmm. they could take it to, I don't know, Africa. And you could have one copy and the whole village could read it. Instead of, you know, because, you know, books in Africa cost a month's salary. So this way it was easy. And access via, you know, the screens and via, you know, e-books, wherever they come from, seemed to me to be a good thing. Now, you don't have to. I have, I have read books on e -book. There's certain books I can't. If they're really, really complicated, really, really interesting, I can't because I want to write all over them and do stuff. They say, yeah, you can do that. Yeah, well. But there's certain, <laughs> but there are other books that I do like very much to read on that, in that way, you know. So I think it's an improvement. There, we're, we're live streaming uh, this event, and even in the audience here, I know we have people who are aspiring writers. You're live streaming writers. this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we, did we not tell you that? I thought that was later on with... Huh? Well, we're going to do that as well. <laughs> you heard me say all that, oh, okay. <laughs> About corn and stuff. Oh. <laughs> so there are... <laughs> There are many writers and aspiring writers who are listening in and even in the audience. And I know this is a question that you weren't fond of, but you had <laughs> such an amazing way of answering it informally when we were having lunch, so I'm going to ask you anyway. And that is, uh, what advice would you give to aspiring writers who want to accomplish even a fraction of what, of what you accomplish? Well, my shorter answer that I gave him was, you write the, and then see what happens. <laughs> if that doesn't work, <laughs> I tell my students, they're young, sort of like many of you, and I say, look, I don't want to, I don't want to hear about your little lives. <laughs> I 
I'm not interested. Besides, you don't know nothing. Your little boyfriends, your grandmother did this, your mother, ah, no. I want you to imagine something way out of the box. Uh, and I've taught a course twice uh, about this. First, I told him, we're gonna write about slavery. You are. Not slavery, slavery, American slavery. I'm talking about all kinds of slavery. All kinds. So a girl came up with the uh, uh, eunuchs. What happens to them and how they are enslaved and how they have to have their genitals in a box that must accompany them when they die. One wrote about the Turks and the whoever they were fighting at the the Moors or something. One person wrote about American slavery. Other people wrote about all different kinds and with characters, you know. And I said, um, after you write this, I'm gonna have somebody from the art department <coughs> come in and tell you how to draw or paint or something because I want, we're gonna have an exhibition and the person who does the art is gonna be not you but the character you invented. Mm -hmm. So, and that happened. I mean, the ones who were good painters wrote stupid stories, but painted beautifully. <laughs> and the ones that couldn't draw a straight line were great stories, and they're like, this is dumb painting. But anyway, <laughs> there were two art forms that we put together. We had the thing, and I did that, you know, a couple of times. But the point was, the second time, you know, a girl wrote about, uh, a woman in Texas who was a waitress, but who couldn't speak English. Actually, wonder when she was a dishwasher, trying to be a waitress, but she had to learn English, and she used the menu and the little doilies around in order to write and so on. It was really interesting. Somebody else did a thing about a woman who was a, I don't know, ancient mistress of somebody in Paris. You know, so the point of all of this was step outside. You don't know anything about this little girl in Texas. So create her. Really create something. Don't go back and say, well, when I was in high school, there was this guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that was really the most successful thrust of um, a teaching creative writing after all these many, many years of just, you know, you know, editing is what I was doing, mostly. They turn in something and I make it better or suggest they make it better. Then I stopped that and began to tell them, you know, like, do this. That was part of the uh, atelier we were talking about. Princeton, yeah. yes. Say more about that, because that was a new collaborative model yeah. that you built. Well, I, about 20 years ago, in my 60s, I, <laughs> in my young, I was going to retire from Princeton. And they said, oh, no, no, no. And I was trying to think, if I stay here, what would I really like to do? I don't want to do this anymore. Um, so I thought, none of us in the arts department bring our work to class. We do that at home, whether we're, you know, writers or poets or photographers or, you know, theater people. What we do in the class is whatever the students are doing. You know, we evaluate, encourage that. And then, I, and then they get a pass or fail. And I thought, why don't I bring artists in who do that for a living? It's not about pass or fail, it's about confronting somebody who is a professional writer or a professional lyricist or a professional dancer and let those people work with the students on a project. And it, you know, it's not entirely equal, but it's close. So American Ballet Theater came, the choreographer came, and he brought some of the dancers from ABT and some of the Princeton dancers. 
uh, who thought they were dancers. They, they used to be dancers. <laughs> you know, the ABT girls don't go to college. They just study dance. And the Princeton girls go to college and used to be dancers. So they were very like, <laughs> but on stage, they could not go on point. I mean, they had, you have to keep on. But the girls from AVG, they were like 18, but they were the ones who could toe dance, as we used to call it. And I bought, you know, Yo-Yo Ma came, all sorts of people came to work on projects that were theirs, and the students, you know, helped mm -hmm. or changed. You know, I had Richard Price came. He was doing a movie, and he had a horrible scene. I mean, it wasn't a horrible scene. It was just long, 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 and he couldn't fix it. So he brought it and asked students to act it out for him so he could see what was too much and what was not enough and so on. So, but it varied. And it's still going on there, by the way. Um, it was, for me, the most exciting thing that I had done uh, in uh, that area because I didn't want to confine it to you know writing I wanted it to be all sorts of things we bought sculptors you know and and painters from galleries and uh, I taught a course with uh, Gabriel Marquez mm -hmm. it's called narrative <laughs> <laughs> he spoke a little bit of English. I spoke a very little bit of Spanish. The only people who were fluent in both languages were the students. <laughs> and we actually taught a semester class, back and forth, back and forth, <laughs> about how to construct narrative. It was beautiful. I was mostly quiet, but... <laughs> It was a magnificent thing to see, to have the students there listening to someone. I mean, if you know Marquez's work, I mean, there's nobody better at constructing a complicated, you know, structural novel, a novel than he is. We're going to open it up to questions. So if anyone in the audience has questions, make your way to the mics. Um, on this theme, inspiration, where do you get inspiration now? Not only for your writing, but just life in general. <laughs> life in general is not so interesting anymore. <laughs> uh, <laughs> excuse me. Notice I'm sick, but I came anyway. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little leery of that inspiration stuff. Mm. I don't need it. I know what to do and I know how to do it. And I don't like the world when I'm not doing it. When I'm not writing, ugh. <laughs> and just aware of some good stuff, but mostly not. The way people have lived as long as I have are. So that it's a little problematic for me. But if I get an idea, like I have in every book I've ever written, some compelling idea, that has some kind of meaning, and then I can uh, pluck characters who can explicate that for me. And then the whole world is such a lovely place, I cannot begin to tell you how fascinating and how overwhelming and lovely it is to be here. I can't tell you. I'd hate to leave. <laughs> yes? I wanted to know uh, some of the artists or works of art that you've read or are reading currently or seen or experiencing that's touching you now and making you glad to be here? Ah, well, a lot of music, I think, which is interesting because I don't, I don't play music when I'm writing. I don't ever use it as background, you know, like something. That I have to either listen to it or not listen to it. So, but recently, uh, particularly when I get stuck, as I sort of have been recently, the music breaks it open for me, the kinds of music that I like, you know. Yes. 
Hi, I had to write my question down because I was so nervous talking to you. Oh, please. <laughs> when I think of your novels, I think of intricate plots that are often unpredictable, colors that become characters, and prose that often reads like poetry. For all of these reasons, when a friend asked for a book recommendation just the other day, I immediately recommended both Beloved and The Bluest Eye as I'd just finished rereading them myself. She said she doesn't like to read your novels because of the graphic violence and rape scenes, and I didn't know how to defend them to her. How would you respond? Tell her to read Homer. <laughs> Speaking of violence and rape. <laughs> Scott? Uh, I have to admit, I'm sure my mom's actually really jealous. She's a high school educator, and she loves teaching your writing to her students, and I think she shared her love of your wor words with, with me, so thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm curious if you ever, in newer novels, uh, or n newer writing, or, or just kind of in-between books, have find times where your characters are either recycled into new characters or interact with new characters and how, how that process at least probably is up in your brain and how that feels and looks and I don't know if that happens at all, I suppose. The, the strong ones you have to get rid of fast. Um, and I don't remember using aspects of one character in another character in another book. I'm fearful of, because uh, in a sense, writers say this and nobody knows what they're talking about, the characters talk to you. They sort of, you have to know their names, you know. They're like ghosts. And you have to introduce yourself so they'll talk. And you get the right name, and they, but they don't shut up. <laughs> they're only interested in themselves. And I have had characters that I just slammed the door. Like Pilot in uh, Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon. She was eating up the book. <laughs> you know, so I had people talk about her. And then every now and then there would be a scene with her. But not, you know, just to, to do that. Because, um, it's, I, as I was telling someone, I don't really like these characters because they just take over. And if you let them, you will do what many authors do do which is you keep writing them in the next book, and the next book. Different scenes, different narratives, same character. And I don't mean just the detective story type. I mean, but you're still writing about that same character, although now it's a 10-year-old girl or a 50-year-old man, but it's still the same character. And I just have to get rid of it because, you know, slam it, because otherwise you're always back there always back there. For me, it's a big effort to write brand new. And feel, you know, every time I sit down to write, it's like I've never written anything ever before. It's a brand new thing. Yes. Thank you. Ms. Morrison, do you think of yourself as a female writer? Is that something that you're aware of in terms of not only what you're writing and your responsibility to your sex, but uh -huh. also in terms of how you're received and how other authors who are female authors are received? Well, I have done that in the beginning, because I was in publishing when I first wrote a book. So I made it very important that I was a black female, underscore, underscore. And they were trying to say, uh, I remember going to an event, and a friend of my doctoral, I think it was, was introducing me. He said, Toni Morrison is wonderful. And she writes people, I don't think of her as a black writer. I don't think of her as a female writer. I think of her as, and he paused, and I said, a white male writer. <laughs> <laughs> so with all those definitions in there, you don't know which ones to push and so on. Recently, as I talked to you about withholding race, is to try to be like a human being writer type. <laughs> uh, but I do know that in the books, I have withdrawn white men. I never write about them. And the reason is not that they're not there, 
in the world and important. It's just that they get in the way. <laughs> you know, you just always the gaze, you know. I, I just don't want that. So I can be free, you know. Like in Desdemona, we were saying earlier that I wrote this thing with Peter Sellers. I said, I will only write it if you take Iago out. <laughs> if he's out of the play, <laughs> we can go forward. Because he just takes over the play, talks all the time. Everybody lies to him or misrepresents something. I'm sorry, that was a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, so you've talked a little bit about teaching writing, which has been really interesting. And I wanted to know how you feel about this somewhat new format we have these days called the writing workshop, where um, you submit a story and the entire class critiques. Oh, yeah, that's what they do. I mean, I used to do that. <laughs> At Princeton, when I was telling you about the things, the choosing strange subject, they had to read in class. And everybody around them could say, horrible, nice, wonderful, I love it, I hate it, what about this? I, so they got that feedback constantly. And they could either do it or not do it. It's like having 15 editors tell you what's wrong or what's beautiful, and me controlling it all. Uh, but that workshop thing, was very much part of the creative writing classes that I taught at Princeton. And it works, particularly with new writers, you know, who, do, you know, they're not quite sure. And they need the uh, comments and critique of their peers. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, how do you judge your own work? How do you know when it's finished, when it's right? And then how do you take criticism after that? But I always know. <laughs> I always know when to stop. I've thought it out so carefully from the beginning to the end. I always know the end, how it's shaped, what it means, and all the themes are in the end. The problem is getting there, you know, how to get there, what the middle is like. Um, and if I can find it that way, uh, then I know I'm finished and I know it's good. Um, the couple of times I have not done that in a couple of books, I made mistakes. I didn't, ju I didn't, uh, I was judging the characters instead of representing them. And that's not my job to say you're bad, you're good, you know. <clears throat> so that's that. The criticism, well, all the bad criticism is bad. <laughs> And untrue. <laughs> and all the good criticism is by brilliant people. <laughs> but as writers, as most people, you remember the bad. You remember like, uh, 1942, remember that you said? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you gotta take it. Was <laughs> yeah. there someone over there? Yeah, there? hi. Uh, so thanks for being here. Where is the person? Um, Hiding down here. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. So I, you talked a little bit about uh, your thoughts about technology and writing, and you sounded pretty optimistic about it, which I'm really happy to hear. Um, but I, I did read something the other day of, of Philip Roth saying that he thought it was like a false nostalgia for the idea that there was a golden age of serious fiction, uh -huh. but that he was worried that these days, with all the <laughs> problems that are the demands on people's attention, let's say. You know, there's always a cell phone ringing, there's always a new thing on, a new email you just got, that, that basically he was worried that um, the, the kind of sustained attention that you need to enjoy a, a good book and a good read is, is, is going away and is, is gonna be lost. And I'm, I'm wondering if you, how you feel about that? I think the alarm that he describes, I would share, except this will, it'll change. It's just like everybody's on the cell phone. Or that's not going to be forever. Uh, nothing is. Um, the one thing that really has lasted is books. I mean, even those ones on wood. <clears throat> I think that he is sorry that things are changing and that 
he may not be able to change with it. Uh, and I understand that feeling of sorrow. I, other authors feel that way also, that they're fighting up against something that they don't understand and they can't participate in. And what about the good old days when, you know? So I don't, I've never been afraid of that. Um, I don't think it'll ever disappear. Books, whether they're hardcover, softcover, e-books, books in the sky, I mean, I don't, <laughs> they'll be there, be on your watches, right? <laughs> so I think it'll be around because the hunger for narrative is as old as the human life. Everything is a story. Everything is art. There is no drive no country, no age in which people did not make art. Whether it was a line in the sand with a thing, or painting on a cave, or dancing, or singing, or painting their faces, or do, putting on costumes. Human beings have always done that, decorated it. Maybe it wasn't you know, as sophisticated as you know, tattoos are, but they could have been. You know, it's there, and the hunger for stories is permanent, eternal, and it will never go away. Never. It's like food, <laughs> which might go away, by the way. <laughs> yes. yes, sir. Hi. Hi. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one uh, is pertaining to, to this work, Home. I was wondering if uh, there are any parallels between uh, this work and uh, uh, you either work uh, in um, the foreigner's home, uh, whether one work inspired the other, uh, and which one came first. And then uh, the second one is about uh, the um, anti-communism um, sentiments in the 1900s up to uh, the 1950s, and uh, in your own words, uh, the death or the, the destruction of capitalism um, in uh, current times. Uh, what do you think is um, pretty good? Huh? Paraphrased. <laughs> <laughs> the death of capitalism. Yes. Go right ahead. <laughs> Go on. What do you think are the sentiments of uh, um, the sentiments towards uh, communism and socialism in the current day, or the change of both uh, capitalism and uh, communism and the way they are uh, accepted into modern day society? What was your first question? <laughs> It was about um, home and uh, the foreigner's home. Ah, yeah. Well, I did this thing at the Louvre, about six weeks of stuff. And I used all, sort of like an expanded atelier. But the foreigner's home for me was, who is the foreigner? There are countries in which you, the people who live there are foreign, I haven't been made foreign. You know, uh, think of countries in Africa. That's where they live, that's their home. But with colonialism, they become strangers and foreigners in their own home. And also the movement of peoples across the seas and rivers now is greater than it has ever been. So the idea of home was mixed and confusing and you know disturbing. And I had used a painting you know, by Gobineau called The Raft of the Medusa, uh, which was uh, a painting of a raft that had been cut loose by some slavers, and they were all lower class people, and they were supposed to drown, and they didn't, and some of them died, and they ate each other, whatever. But anyway, there was this one figure at the top pointing toward the a ship that he thinks is coming. But they were cut loose and they were floating on the sea, waiting for help, refugees. And they were from all sorts of countries. And I used that in the Gonzalo as a kind of a theme for what home meant, or it's becoming to mean, when people are in huge refugee camps, or in prisons in other countries, or were run out of things, so that the whole notion of home is far more complex than it ever was when people were just immigrants going from A to B and so on. And you said something about capitalism and socialism and, you know, I don't know. I think 
raw capitalism, predatory capitalism, is predatory and is bad. It doesn't have to be that way. Uh, it can be moral, moral. Uh, although I don't think the profit motive helps, but there are instances. Every now and then you see a huge corporation do something, I should say, googly, uh, <laughs> something important. You know, it's not all downhill. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> F final question. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, so there are a number of uh, passages in home where I felt myself uh, mentally transporting my, uh, I guess my perspective backwards decades because of the scenery and the uh, situations you were describing, I'm thinking this must be the 1880s, and, I ha and <laughs> there'll be uh, uh, the next sentences, and she loved to watch I Love Lucy. And I'm like, oh my god, this, is, you know, this wasn't that long ago. Um, and so it had the, the effect, I guess, you were going for on me, certainly. And like, I, you know, I had this connection, it's not that long ago. Um, and so uh, my question is, uh, you, you say that we, we didn't do a very good job in the 50s of uh, of representing what was actually happening in our media. Um, and so are we, is that inevitable, you think, over time? Or are we doing a better or worse job uh, today? Uh, that period is being uh, described more exactly by other writers now. Chang Ray Lee wrote a wonderful book called, I don't know what it was called, but anyway, about that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and Jane Smiley has a character in there. So that period is being written about and paid attention to by really, really first-rate writers the way I thought it hadn't been before. Um, the second part of your question. The second part is, uh, are we doing the same, are we making the same mistakes today? Um, and I'm, I'm sure we are, but <laughs> I wonder if you could talk about it. Today. I don't understand today. I'm writing a book about, that's not like the 50s or the 20s, it's more, mo more recent. I have an awful time, because I don't really understand, I don't have the fabric yet, you know? Uh, I'm trying. <laughs> but there's something very different and elusive about contemporary culture. I think, you know, all of, you understand that all of our periods have been defined by war, all of them. War is about the acquisition of wealth or land, period. And then somehow it's not about any of that. You know, somebody can tell me what the World War I was about. You don't know. They said, well, this one, they were all family members. The queen was related to the German, who was related to the Kaiser and the, you know, so. World War II, that was important. That was a real serious, we got to stop. Everything else is not. It's about something else. So I'm, my thing is, my feeling, there is a lot of war, I don't know if you, is that war is the language, meaning. They treat it like it's a movie. When is it going to be over? When's the end? When you, you know, we talk about it <laughs> like, it's a theater in the German, in the press. We've been there 10 years. Nobody asked that question in World War II. When is it going to be over? It was over when they stopped. So I think there's a whole different thing. And there's a resistance toward war that's under, you know, it's not, people are not enthusiastic about it. Uh, yay, you know, let's go invade or something. It seems to me not so thrilling an idea. Apparently there's something else to do. I think the drone thing is uh, a sign of people sort of withdrawing from uh, death and destruction and so on and so on. Uh, although they say, well, you know, you killed an American. What about that? Americans who give up their citizenship in World War II were shot because they joined the enemy. <laughs> and they were understood to be the enemy. 
Nobody said, where's your passport? <laughs> Are you an American or not? Well, anyway, I want to go on. But the point is that there is a big change. I haven't grasped it. I don't know if war is the only entrance, but for me, it seems that the changing, cult, the cultures change toward a whole bunch of things that were not, that, were, that seemed permanent, you know, 20 years ago are not anymore. And, and the attitude toward war is one of the changes, uh, although we may still be involved in some aspect of them, but it's narrower, so. Otherwise, I'm gonna look to you to tell me what's going on. <laughs> Ms. Morrison, thank you. You're welcome.